early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. So where are the fashion enthusiasts? Gather here, gather here, there's something for you. This is Friday. Tomorrow you want to look stunning when you show up at that event to which you've been invited. And there's one person to look at the evolution of the fashion industry in Nigeria. You agree that there's really been an evolution. Uh, once upon a time, when you watch some epic Nollywood movies, you'll find that uh, they show women wearing something like just having something to cover the chest and then uh, some wrapper kind of skirts. And then it moved away even for the head dirt that also changed to what we have now. And even when Nadarin designers began to do something with the Ankara fabric, do designs, we saw how all of that changed and it even became a big accepted in the formal industry that today you could see people rock an Ankara suit to work. Joining us this morning in person in the studio is Data Okorududu. She's the hair designer and founder JD7 Couture. She is a fashion icon. Good morning. Welcome Good. to an exchange. Good morning. Thank you for having me. No I one would look at you and guess your profession wrongly because you look it. <laughs> you actually represent you what you preach. Oh, okay. Thank you. Glad to have you join us. Thank you very much. Yeah. If we look at the fashion industry, like I have said, it's come a long way in Nigeria. Could you take us through the different stages and how it arrived where it is right now? Currently, not even currently, because it should be worth more than that. As of 2023, the fashion industry in Nigeria was said to be worth over $6.1 billion. That's a lot of money. Yeah. The fashion industry worldwide is a multi-billion dollar industry. Some countries take it seriously, some don't. Well, the fashion, evolution of fashion, it actually started from the Garden of Eden, if you ask me. Mm. The first fig leaves that Eve used to cover her nakedness after she ate the apple, that was fashion. <laughs> that, was how, that was how it started. Immediately she knew she was naked, she had to cover up. Well, in Africa, especially in Nigeria, I, I still have photographs of my great-grandfather's picture in the king's palace, King Jaja of Opobo with his wives. They didn't have anything on here. They had some traditional wrappers and they were, they were all stuck naked, yeah, you know? So we've come a long way. We've got, a lot of people think fashion is there to put on clothes and cover nakedness. No, fashion is multifaceted. Fashion is the glasses you're wearing, it's fashion. You understand the way you talk, especially your hair, your kitchen, your bedroom. Fashion is, can be related in every aspect of our lives. But we take the clothing line, the shoes, and all the accessories that come with it. I didn't really, I studied mass communication, actually specialized in broadcast. Oh, oh that's yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah. But. Um, Glad to know you're one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was supposed to be, I did a five year stint with you, did that? And uh, as uh, corporate affairs, I specialized in broadcast, actually. but. Um, one of our presidents, Nigerian president, I think it was President Olusegun Obasanjo, was trying to kind of foster this backward integration and decided that no more importation of anything except it is absolutely essential. So when I left Unilever, I was bringing in, I was into corporate games, you know, Something too that's related to public relations and advertising, what I specialize in. And there was nothing else to present to corporate bodies. So we had to think. He actually made us think. And the only thing we could work with were fabrics that were manufactured here. They are quaities, they are showcase, they tie and dyes, they are dress. And what could you do with it? tablecloths, napkins, you know, things you could do, jute bags, bags, for corporate bodies, you, it, you, it made you think. And that was when I just got one tailor. I started making my jute bags for my corporate, whatever. Well, the multinational companies like Shell, they were very happy, they liked it because most of their clients too were international. So when they ship international African things, you know, they were happy, they patronized us, but a lot of people did it. So what did I do? Instead of the tailors to sit there, say, okay, make my clothes. Instead of me to go to tailors' house, so that was how I started my fashion, <laughs> my fashion stint. 
in this industry, when I joined, there were a few people, there were a few other um, fashion gurus, I would say, and the, the fashion designers and stuff. But um, it wasn't as if anybody took it the formal business-like way that it was done internationally, okay? Internationally, there were seasons. People now came and determined what is going to be for next season and put it out there. We here were not about that. Just so you have a wedding, bring your ashwabi and make for you. Your friend like it. I want to copy this style. You understand? When we started, there was nothing like internet. There was nothing like all these uh, social media platforms and all. So it was, yeah, it is what to word, you know, uh, references. And I started having a lot of reference. When I started, I didn't start out as a fashion designer. All of a sudden, just, just like that, I had too many people asking me to make clothes for them. I would be stopped in the supermarket. Who made this outfit for you? I'm like, I made it myself. Please, please, where is your shop? That was how I started my fashion designing. And it just went boom. The first year I went commercial, I was invited to Paris to come and showcase because of my creativity, the house and all that kind of thing. But the fashion industry, if you want to talk about evolution, it's come a long way. It's come a long way. We've gone from when we were plaiting our heads with thread, yeah, and wearing, if you watch First Act 77, you will just see what our fashion, whatever. We've gone a long way. From when we, were, when we started wearing long tail, dresses or red carpets. We do use all those red carpet events. They invite you for something, you just went in there and did it. But you see, with time, with exposure, with the advent of the internet, you know, why that the, the, the world be, became a global village. So we started seeing what others were doing. And we started doing that. Some of us actually, some of the fashion designers actually tried to step out there and set up businesses internationally. So we could import some of what we learned from them and also export some things. But with that said, the difficulties still abound here. First of all, there are cultural differences. Second of all, there are disease mentality that if you're in the fashion industry, you must be, you don't have brain, you're not a medical doctor, you're not a lawyer with fashion, so. Mm. So if you have a daughter that say, that has a natural creative ability, you kill it because you want her to be a doctor or whatever. Forgetting that you can actually make a lot of money from fashion. That was what, one of the things that I was preaching against when I came into the scene. And I tried for like five years but it wasn't going to work because you cannot run faster than your environment. So even when I was doing international fashion shows, inviting Fashion Week producers from Canada, from DC and come here, I would still want them to talk to them that don't make this a permanent job, okay? Because of the kind of environment you live in, especially the models too, make sure you finish your university education, make sure you have your education, make sure you have an alternative job. And as we were going along that route, the COVID struck. And with COVID, where are you going to? Nowhere. So a lot of the fashion houses just went. Mm. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now that you talked about uh, what happened during COVID, you also yeah realized that that was at the point a lot of people embrace technology. Yes, so let's talk exactly. about the convergence that happened between fashion yeah. and e-commerce, yeah. where you now have fashion e-commerce, which has been estimated to what about $400 million okay. in Nigeria. Now, you're, when doing your introduction, you talked mm -hmm. about the fact that when you started fashion, there was no internet, but now yeah. Yeah. that's the trend. So the yeah. place of e-commerce. What kind of paradigm shift has e-commerce brought into fashion business, especially in the, Nigeria? The, the tradition in Nigeria for fashion, mostly, if you look at the business sense, is high fashion couture. You come and take your measurements and make something for your size, 
for your taste, for the outing you want to go to. Most of the e-commerce thing actually ride on commercial production, okay? Like school uniforms, ready-to-wear things, even evening things. Nigerians haven't really, they do e-commerce business, but let me tell you the attitude of a lot of my clients and a lot of Nigerian women, especially the high society women. When they see it in the pages of papers, they don't want it anymore. Why? It is common. What could be the reasons for this? It is this? common. They want something exclusive, very, very exclusive. Not necessarily that they're ready to pay for exclusivity that much. Some of them are, but very few of them are. But a lot of them, when they see it on you, it's no longer original. So you have to keep on churning out very original things, especially for those big high society weddings and stuff. Ready to wear, a lot of Nigerian women would rather just go to Balogo, go to somewhere and just buy something off the rack and just take that ready to wear. Most of it is imported. So why do they have the preference for foreign made dresses that are ready to wear? but would have issues with uh, the ones made by Nigerian designers when they see them yeah. on the pages of magazines or see them online. Th that, was, that was a time that was true, yeah? That was a time that they preferred when Dubai came on the scene. For a few, few moments there, a lot of them were wearing all these heavily encrusted Arab looking like whatever. But after that time, it died out too. Once they say uh, that Dubai thing, it became something a little bit derogatory. They don't want it anymore. The fashion industry and the fashion trend, it's so volatile. They start with this today, tomorrow they don't want it. Do you understand? But people, few people, few of the clientele still prefer. And the Nigerian designers with Nigerian fabrics or with originality. Even if you don't want to use the Nigerian fabric, they still prefer because they know maybe you're going to be the only person that will have this outfit. Because those Dubai or international things, they don't make it exclusively for you. If they make it as you, you know how much you're going to pay. A lot of them don't pay that amount of money. So we are back to Nigerian designers churning out very exclusive things for exclusive clientele. So, if the Nigerian fashion industry, the, 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 the Nigerian fashion customers mm. are the type that would want exclusive things, mm. what sort of pressure does that put on the designers? Oh. And how's the market? The market is there. The market is there, but honestly, it's, um, it's not something you're going to make your living on. It's something you can use to hold your special clientele, you understand? Because what is the percentage of this clientele? Maybe two, five percent. And you cannot run a business on five percent. That's the truth. Has e-commerce so, not improved that? Ah, the problem with e-commerce is the attitude towards it is still, it hasn't gotten there yet. You know, Max and Spencer, for instance, you can order something from Max and Spencer. They do very intelligent labeling. They have the petite. So you can order a size 12. But size 12 can be a size 12 long feet, short feet, medium feet. Okay? Nigerians haven't gotten that yet. That aside, we have very few outlets. Do you understand? International, they have buyers. Buyers actually come to designers and say, I want you to make me long black skirts. I want 5,000 pieces in three months when you go to work. It's not your business whether they are going to sell it or not. But in Nigeria, you are responsible for designing, you are responsible for purchasing, you are responsible for selling, you are responsible for paying all the expenses. So we haven't really quite organized to that level yet. We have few, we have few outlets. And the designers, most of the people, if you talk to them, they will tell you that they're not quite happy because, well, most of the profit go to the outlets. But that's how it is. Because after my second show in Paris, I remember Gallery Lafayette called me. 
They wanted to start stopping some of my product because they were so carried away with that. So I had a meeting with them. And after my meeting, I went back to my hotel room and did some mathematics and calculate. I'm like, what the disable thing they <laughs> I'll probably be working for them. Absolutely nothing. So I said, no. I'd rather just come back home. You come to me and you say, I have this event and I want to look like this. I want to look like this. This is the color or this is my show. And I go to town and you pay for my creativity. That was my choice. Few designers tried it, but later they pulled out. It's not that easy. It's not, especially now, these days, when we have all this bad A problem and electricity, it's not easy. It has never been, really. When you do not have the cultural differences, when you do not have the attitude of the people, you have the environment just inviting you and trying to translate every effort to make. But oh, if oh. you're a creative person, you will enjoy doing it nevertheless. Let's see how we can provide solutions to this. Now that the federal government is, you know, has launched uh, an, an export center in Lagos, okay. and the essence of that center is to see how to promote or facilitate the process for fashion e-commerce in Nigeria. What, looking at all these factors that you talked about, the challenges, the problem, the perception, the issue of infrastructure and all that, mm. what would you expect the federal government to do differently now that you have a center created for this purpose to address all this and then the issue of challenges being experienced by fashion? Because that's the trend. We're at a time where digital revolution runs every sector. Yeah. For this to become a reality now that the pro federal government has launched a program to facilitate this, what should be done differently? Okay. First of all, we have to get our power solutions sorted ASAP. Without it, we will just be joking. This is not the first time this has happened. I don't know if you remember Tinapa. Yeah, yeah. I was there for the Calabar Fashion Week. I was one of the top designers that stayed there when Donald Duke was a governor. He started something, but immediately he left, he died. We went with him, okay? But even when he was there, we went to Tinapa. We did the fashion show, Calabar Fashion Week. They took us to the shops, in the so-called street free zone. We couldn't afford a shop. There were only two outlets in the whole of the area that could afford it. You, you even pay in dollars. So what was the point? A lot of designers came, did the calculations, and said, oh, this is not for me. I don't want to say I don't want to depend on the government because you have to, okay? When people are serious with, the, with intentions that are real and positive and true, you will know. You will know. If they establish a trade-free zone and encourage designers, a lot of Nigerian designers have been all over the world, from Paris to Italy. I attended, I, I participated in DC Fashion Week. Some of the Nigerian designers here in Nigeria are some of the best in the world. Raw talents. We just, they don't, they don't have enough encouragement. If they do, they will do very well. Because you take your clothes, you wrap a wrap. When I go to the US, I don't, I, I wear Ankara and I dress, I braid my hair and crimp it. People are dragging you down the street, male, female, elderly ones, young ones. Where are you from? What's this outfit? I'm Nigeria to say no. Because the, the what they hear about Nigeria is all this very bad negative news. So for me, for me, Nigerian designers are hungry. They are waiting. Once they can get an enabling environment, that will be it. That will be honestly, they will fly because we are very raw. We are very raw, and our culture, the diversity of what we have here, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. It is. Apart from the power issue, earlier you mentioned that um, the outlets seem to be ripping off. No. 
So what structure needs to be in place in the adrenaline fashion industry to ensure that designers here mm. get as much gain as those in other climes? There are designers that have lived for decades, for generations, and their, um, their clothes, their designs are still much appreciated. So what needs to be in structure? What structure needs to be in place in Nigeria? The designers get what is due theirs, the outlets, and everyone is just okay. happy. Okay, first of all, you have to decide for yourself. Do you want to just be appreciated or you want to be able to make a living out of the work that you do? I want both, okay? I want to be able to make a living out of what I do and I want to be appreciated as well. Now, if there is a kind of uh, set values, it's like sometimes when you go and you apply for a contract in a place, you put all your costs down, all the costs, because they can go back and actually go and reevaluate the costs and find out whether you have overquoted or whatever. But if you quote exactly at cost and you put profit at 25%, you know, that there are certain, yeah, we can reestablish that in the fashion industry. It's okay. Your tailors. A lot of people think designers are tailors, no? Mm. So what's the difference? Because there seems, it seems to be like it, a class thing, this area. Uh, <laughs> no, tailors no, no, are what no. you find on your street. Designer no, no, is the... <laughs> no, 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 no. Tailors are the ones, how would I put it? It's like the difference between an architect and a builder. And even the builder, they have their own people, the masons, the, the people who do the cement work and the carpentry. You understand? There's a lot that goes into it. You can start with your embroidery. Even with embroidery, there are three or four different types of embroidery and they specialize in them. There are the cutters, there are the people who cut. There are the people who do street sewing. There are the people who do the complicated styles. Okay? Now, if you go to a, a tailoring school, I don't know if we're digressing. <laughs> if you go to a tailoring school, they will teach you the basics, okay? If you get somebody like me now, I can take the basics and tweak it into three different places, and they get confused. So you have to sit with them and say, okay, when you finish doing this, which is a straight way cut of, of what you know, just bend it back. They will be looking at me like, but when we are finish, and it turns out like, they're like, whoa. But the tailor is not necessarily the creative mind in the fashion industry. The tailor takes the stick and, and stitches, and, and some people can do, well, I can't, I don't. You understand, you have to specialize so that, you know, you give yourself time for creativity. Still on the issue of perception, um, mm -hmm. I'll, my, my question is going to be like a two in one. The perce uh, perception as regards e-commerce, Mm -hmm. I'm looking at what do you think could be the kind of incentives, if I may use the word magic wand, that can be put in place mm -hmm. to ensure that Nigerians embrace mm -hmm. fashion e-commerce. You talked about the perception yeah. about it, yeah. but what, can, what kind of incentives can be put in place to encourage it? Then also, you have the influx of non-experts in the fashion industry and the perception as regards experts in the industry as people who sees it as second convention or second uh, uh, profession. Mm -hmm. How do we create that perception, which you have people who have master's PhD in fashion? Oh, yeah. um, you, you can't correct it because you cannot go and tell somebody not to sew. It's a personal decision. But the clients that you service, you can, you can create your niche with the clients that you service. I know there are some clients that will not dare. When they want to wear certain things, they can go to other tailors. They even tell me, it's not very good, but when they need the real high fashion thing that, that requires creativity, they come to me, all right? So you can't really control that. What you can control is what you do as an individual designer, individual tailor and all that. Yeah. I know some designers that during COVID, they just set up their place and call different tailors, just be sewing for different people, just give me a few percentage for using my machine and using my electricity. You understand? And like I said, design is not just about clothes, you know? There are certain things that one size fits all, like beddings. I design beddings very well too. But you see, that is easier for e-commerce because 
a king size bed is a king size bed. You just know the width of the mattress and the thickness. You know how to do the fitted sheets. Well, what of if you have some now, of these now materials? Where, where I come in yeah. is, yes, it's cut to measure. Anybody can make six by six bed sheets. But it is the creativity comes in how I design the bed sheet. What are the appliques I put on it? What are the embroidery work I put on it? That is what makes me different from the normal person. So it's up to you. Mine might be slightly more expensive because I put some stones and maybe some tiles or whatever to the sheets. But yo, some other person will just say, I want something. What of it is cheaper? Could it that be another form of incentives to encourage people to patronize the e-commerce platform? Not, not necessarily. No, necessarily because maybe because I service, I do mostly couture, and couture is not cheap. Because if you're really, really creative, you don't just you don't just make six by six sheets and just let it. I, I I would even if you can't pay for it, I find myself doing it because this is who I am. You understand? You can make certain things cheap. It's it's not easy. Let me tell you why. Because we hardly manufacture. Even the textile industry, they all went down. You understand? Even the, the Ankara industry, they are all having problems. I remember that Vlisco had to move out. Daviva, I don't know if they still exist. So they come and they go. Because the environment is not too, 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 too kind to manufacture. Sometimes it's actually cheaper to bring in fabrics. So what's my... Igbo merchants do, Igbo brothers, they do. They go to abroad and go to manufacturing companies. And what they bring in, they're like, you know, anytime you manufacture something, you have uh, factory defects. So they roll it. If the factory defect on, on this line is maybe 100 meters, somebody there can, can decide, let me just roll out 200 just to be sure. When you get the 200 meters and they bring it here. Sometimes the fabric you get abroad is much more expensive. What you get here is cheaper. It's crazy. And you use it. We take advantage of that too. But is it cheap? Yes. If you want something free. But most people who are serious about fashion, they really don't go for cheap. That's the truth. That's why street brands and couture brands are not the same. You understand? You can get the same pair of shoes from Valentino, and you can get something similar on the street. They might not be different. Valentino does not make the shoes. He puts his name there. He designs. Okay, but that's for a, a segment of the market. There's yeah. some class of customers who would want something very expensive, yeah. Yeah. but there are other classes of people who just want something trendy. Online, you find different designs, and sometimes yeah. you find... Um, arguments between designers one calling the other out over oh this person stole my design bringing us to the issue of intellectual property mm -hmm. as much as the internet is there to make e-commerce thrive mm -hmm. issues like um, uh, intellectual property how do you handle that and earlier on you mentioned too that one could order a design from a very popular brand i wouldn't want to mention the name mm -hmm. because they haven't dropped their money here <laughs> <laughs> that's okay okay and if it's a size 12 for instance or a size 10 yeah. anybody of that size could wear it does it have to do with the fabric that they use making it possible for anyone of a size 10 12 to fit into what they've made or it's about the training that some Nigerian designers don't have yet that makes it impossible for them to reap the gains of people just ordering, oh, I've seen this design, and they just order that exact same piece, it fits and they wear. See, the problem with choices like that is also in the texture of the fabric, right? You all say a size tall, right? The dress you're wearing now, if there's an imported one that has fabric that has four-way stretchability, okay? If I want to cut it for you, to make an outfit for you, I'll cut you a size six. But the Nigerian person here will see it online and do not, you can't, you know, online, you can't text. You don't know the texture of the fabric. You don't know whether it stretches two times or four times or three ways or four ways or, just, or it doesn't stretch at all. Can now use an Ankara. 
and make the same style, it will never fit the same way. It's just the experience and it will never fit the same way. So you can go and buy it online. It could actually be a dress that you already have. And you saw it in Ankara, so, oh, this dress really fits me. I like the way it sits on me. And you go and buy it in a different type of fabric. It will never fit you. It will never. But they don't understand that. Now they blame it on the designer. You didn't tell the designer that the dress you have, even though it's a sex swell, stretches in four ways. You say, I want it in Ankara, and they make it in Ankara for you. They use the same measurement and it should never go. <laughs> Just, just the way it is. So how do you deal with issues of uh, intellectual so property in my design? You go to more exp ex experienced designers <laughs> that understand what they're doing. This issue of intellectual property, it didn't start today. Sometimes things actually kind of overlap. You can make something and it will look very, very similar. Because people, these things come from the blues. Your creativity, the ideas come from the blues. But where I will say, okay, you have the right to your intellectual property is if you designed the fabric, if you design the colors that go on that fabric. Not and the style? Make it, not even with the style. If you design the fabric, you design the style, and then somebody copies it. Where did the person get the fabric? Where did the person get the color? Where did the person get the style? It's not just about the styling. Don't forget that some designers go and pay very dearly to manufacturers of textiles and give them and pay a design creative designer that does creative arts. Say, I want this for me. And they sign an intellectual property agreement. That's how it goes. But see, a straight is a sleeveless. Who are you going to say this? I, I, I invented it. No, you didn't. You didn't. But if you invented the color, you invented the texture, you invented the, the design concept of the fabric, the patterns, then you can claim that. And if the design is so couture that you know, you've never seen it, and then somebody copies that, very high fashion couture, yes, you can, you can sue. Okay. All right, as we wrap up, you talked about uh, uh, the need for standardization, which is where training comes in. Yeah. You are familiar with this phrase or this slang, what I order versus what I got. <laughs> yeah. That's very peculiar where customers complain about their particular kind of style and then mm. eventually what they got is not looking like what they wanted. Sometimes, yeah. Why do you think we have this trend? How can it be corrected? Talking about training standardization. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you something about tailors. They are, how would I put it? They are like musicians. Sometimes they go crazy. I've had a tailor that put a male shirt sleeve on one side and a female shirt because he was tired. What saved me was before I go take outfits to my clients waiting in the city area, I come to the tailoring unit, I look at what is happening. And we looked at him. The rest of the tailors they were laughing at him. They were calling him madman, mad tailor. But it happens. This is just an example, okay? Apart from if you're making couture outfit made to measure, we in Nigerian women, especially, they never stay the same size. Everybody we know that. And some of them are in denial. Some of them are size 20. So, no, 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 I'm size 16. Talk to the size 16. I, I don't do it anymore. I, if, you, if you are abroad, because I have some of my clients internationally, I give you a measurement guide. Use your hand. Don't add any allowance for me. Just go exactly. Don't pull too tight. Don't lose it. Just go exactly. And I tell you, you know, how to measure. And you find that there are, there are no size 16s. And you cannot go, keep going, because to freight things to the US now, to the UK or to Australia, it's quite expensive. So sometimes you don't blame the tailor. Sometimes you also blame the designer. Sometimes you blame the client. A client, you make an outfit for somebody in January by March, because you know, increase two dress sizes. I might not even know. 
But she says she found herself wearing just big, long, dressy shirts with her stretching pants. I said, sweetheart, it's because the other ones are too tight and uncomfortable because you put on a bit of weight. Nigerian women don't like to hear that, you understand. Sometimes the tailors, they have different grades of tailors. There are A grades, B grades, C grades, and, and so forth. There are certain complicated things you can give to an A grade tailor, and you can have it, you won't have a lot of fitting and refitting. But the, so you, you just have to just manage your tailors. All right, as we wrap up, on a lighter note, you talked about your background in mass comm. Yep. You're into fashion. Do you still miss broadcasting? Mm, not really. Not really? I still talk in So fashion is your first love? No, 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 no. I'm into properties. Oh, yes. Yeah. It was my first love until I lost my husband uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Oh, so I had to come back home and reprioritize you understand? Because the fashion was not what was bringing the bulk of the income to the family and I had to feed my children. <laughs> so it's still there because it's something I actually enjoy doing. Yeah. It's not as if it doesn't bring income. It does, but not the kind of income. So we can still have a situation where, uh, apart from doing uh, fashion business, you can still do other things just to complement. I encourage every Nigerian. All right to have at least more than two sources, streams of income. Otherwise, you won't survive. Mm. There is no surviving. You have to. Okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, from one woman to another, you were talking about Nigerian women, not some of them not staying same size for a very long time, yeah. size changes. But looking at you, I'm privy to an information that I do not want to spill. But I just want you to share some beauty secrets because while talking about fashion, you said mm. it's not just about the clothes you wear, yeah. it's about the hair, yeah. the accessories, how you talk, and even yeah. the things you do. Yeah. So for you, what are some secrets or some tips that you can share so that the Nigerian woman can stay fashionable? <laughs> and this is the weekend that we're getting yeah. into now. So tomorrow, People will be at several events, even in your styling. Could you share some yeah. tea? Not just we men. Let me be jealous. Yeah, yeah. Even for men. Men. Yeah. <laughs> men. I think, I think um, you should appreciate versatility in, in human beings. People are different. It's like, it's like if you go into the wild and look at the flowers that God Almighty has created, because God Almighty is the number one fashion designer in the whole universe. You will know that, yeah? You see the lilies of the valley, they are small, but they are pretty. You see the roses, you see the lily, you know, there are different types of flowers. We human beings are made like that. Some people are a little bit exaggerated. Some people like to keep it a little simple. Some people like to show off, you understand, but I will beg Nigerian women that <laughs> there is a very thin dividing line between tr trying too hard or trying to be overtly sexy and giving away the farm. Nobody likes that. That's the truth. And it's not in our culture to do that. I'll, I'll actually, I I respect the culture. Like, first time, so, so where some people came in with their boobs all over the place. You know it's your Nigerian culture. I've seen a woman, one of the traditional women, came to church. She's from Mundo, one of the royal families. The royal family, she came. She wore her like a bustier and add um, Ashoke, you know those on the Ashoke, with her beads here, with her crown. She came, she sat down. It was okay. But if you're a woman, you wear a boob dress into church, they will come and ask you what's the matter with you. Why is that? We don't know. So for me, a lot of people to be who they want to be, okay? But I try to, there are certain things a client will want. I'm like, no, 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 this will be too much. When, it, when you're going to decide anything that will affect my work and my image, I will stop it. I'd rather not do the job. Mm. Thank you so much for doing this job of talking about fashion industry so well. Uh, we've been speaking with that uh, Okuru Dudu, the head designer and founder, JD7 Couture. And she's spoken extensively about the evolution of the fashion industry in Nigeria, the challenges, the prospect, and so much more that uh, designers can do.
explaining the difference between tailors and designers. So you know who you have. If you have a tailor, you know how to manage them. If you have a designer, yeah. know also how to manage them. Thank you so much for being here. And I must say you look elegant. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. That's the size of the show for this week. You do know that an exchange has been running from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and this has been the grand finale for the week. I am blessing AJ. One thing you can do for us is now to go to a social media platforms. The handle is at Soup News TV on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Leave a comment. Tell us something about today's show, and you can like. Feel free to share to your friends, particularly if you have some of them who are fashion enthusiasts. The show returns Monday, 8 a.m. West African time. Be sure to enjoy your weekend. Some one bears allowed, if that will make you happy and relaxed. All right. In addition to that, don't forget Market Insight comes up at 11. This is where you get the latest trend and development when it comes to the global market. And you need to keep abreast with that for you to know the latest development. Don't forget the conversation continues on our social media platform as we wrap up. It's Friday. Thanks for watching. I remain Femaya Dili. Enjoy your weekend. Early exchange. Shaping policy, advancing development.